of us, I'm guessing, isn't about to make one either. But that hasn't stopped Guillaume Paré, the uh, director, the CEO of Airbus, from joining me to discuss exactly what's happening. Now, bear in mind the number of airlines that have cancelled, delayed, restricted new purchases. It's left Airbus with what I thought was a lot of planes. Let us start with the state of the industry, if you like. The state as seen by Airbus, because from what I can see, it suggests things are getting better, faster than we might have thought. There is actually a lot of diversity uh, in the situations we are, we are observing. Um, indeed, on the single aisle business, we are in discussion with customers and uh, they see the recovery coming or they're already in the beginning of the recovery. And uh, after a year and a half of uh, very tough situation and much lower level of deliveries, uh, we see that uh, the slots, the, the deliveries which have been deferred um, are now uh, coming at a point where uh, we will need to uh, increase our production to serve that demand. That's a very situation, very different situation on the wide bodies. Huh? And um, as we have confirmed recently, we think we are in this scenario of uh, uh, lower for longer. It's, it's a long and difficult situation for the long haul business. Uh, the, obviously, the narrow body, I see you've been warning your suppliers to prepare for some sort of ramp up. And you're talking about heading back to the 40s per, per single aisle planes uh, per month. When do you think you'll get to that sort of level? We were at uh, around 60 a month um, beginning of 2020, just before being hit by the pandemic. Then we adjusted to 40 a month. So it's a very significant reduction. And compared to what we had planned, it's roughly minus 40%. Uh, we're still at that rate as we speak, but uh, we will start to ramp up slightly by uh, end of this year. We should be at around 45 by end of 2021. And then we will continue to ramp up because that demand that has not been served uh, needs now to, to be uh, served and we need to be ready to deliver around uh, 60 again, uh, sort of three years after uh, the start of the pandemic. So for the single line, it's a sort of three years drop. Right. And I'm wondering, do you think the recovery in the single aisle, A, they're cheaper planes, but, but, but also they serve markets that are reopening faster, domestic markets in the United States, intra-EU markets within Europe, ASEAN markets, where there's likely to be a lot faster rather than the transcontinental stuff that requires wide bodies. Yes, Richard, that, that's exactly the point. Uh, the reopening is starting by country, by regions, um, for a number of reasons, but mainly because of the way the pandemic is being managed. Um, and also because there are very different ways of dealing with the situation uh, by blocks, US, China, Europe, and the reopening of the traffic between those blocks will take more time. If this is the case, how do you see your ability to manage Airbus through this transition? Because you've, you, you've sort of scaled back and now you have to slowly ramp up, but at the same time, keep the supplier base going in very difficult circumstances. How difficult is that to manage? Uh, it's been a roller coaster for the industry, for the OEMs, but as well for the suppliers. Um, they were, we were all together in a very steep ramp up in 18, 19, beginning of 2020. Then we had to do a very fast and challenging ramp down. Uh, being at a much lower rate now than we were before and all the adaptation that, that comes with it. And now we have to ramp up again. And uh, we think it's a lot about anticipation, about uh, planning, about uh, scheduling, onboarding, recruiting people, uh, training uh, and be ready on time. That's the reason why we have tried to be as transparent as we can moving forward, giving indication of what we think will happen. I know that you've worked with airlines rescheduling delivery dates, particularly on the, on the wide-bodied uh, equipment, 
but how many airlines have either gone bust and left you with planes or have simply said, Guillaume, I'm not taking them, do what you like? We've had many, many different situations uh, depending on the airlines and also over time. Uh, it's fair to say that the airlines have been and are in a very difficult environment. Uh, it's sometimes uh, life-threatening for the airlines. Uh, but I would say, generally speaking, uh, we're able to find solutions to sit down, to look at the situation as it is and work hard to find outcomes that are manageable, more or less manageable for all parties. But it's been a very difficult uh, period of time, and it will continue to be, and it uh, takes a lot of work, a lot of negotiation, a lot of creativity as well to find a solution that can work. It reminds me of the old, you know, the old joke about, I owe the bank uh, 500, that's my problem. I owe the bank 50 million, that's the bank's problem. I mean, an airline that's, <laughs> that's got a large order book with you, there is a vested interest on both sides to sort that out, isn't there? Nobody wants to push the other to the brink. That's right. But what we have observed as well is uh, the trust of the majority, if not all airlines, that there will be a recovery, that they will need modern planes moving forward, that it will be a tough competition in the market. And to be equipped to compete, they need planes. And therefore, as I have said already a couple of uh, times uh, before, uh, we thought uh, entering into the pandemic, there would be more cancellations than what we have actually uh, observed. In this case, we also take the opportunity to look at the environment. Um, I know you have a very ambitious plans where the environment's concerned. How far have those plans had to be adjourned, not cancelled, but just put off, delayed, moved to the future whilst you're dealing with the crisis? Net zero, everybody's working towards it and aviation continues to be one of the most criticised uh, um, sectors. Yeah. I believe and, and the team around me believes that um, this mega trend of uh, environment, global warming, and the pressure that comes on many industries, including aviation, is very strong, will not slow down. Um, and we have not, um, we have not uh, reduced our ambitions and our speed when it comes to environment, to net zero, to the decarbonization of aviation. So we have trimmed a lot of projects. We have reduced our capex, our, our expenses. But on the R&T side, on, on the technologies, we have maintained the pace. Since we're talking to A4E, who are sort of well versed in all of these things, aviation is continuing. And in fact, I would say aviation, the criticism of aviation is growing despite all the technological advances and the improvements. But the perception as a polluter continues even greater. And I'm wondering what more the industry can do to get its message across if indeed it can, or is it just going to be tarred? We need to probably uh, communicate differently uh, to at least have uh, the public having the right uh, figures in mind, the right share of uh, aviation contributing to the global warming, because we seem to be a bit here and there the scapegoat of the global warming. Yeah. There are maybe other forces at play. I mean, um, Fighting against aviation is also a way to uh, fight against globalization. And sometimes uh, carbon is used uh, as an argument to, um, to fight against aviation for other reasons. But I think we have a duty as an industry. We've been growing. We've been very successful. Now we have this headwind. We have a duty as an industry to do more, but as well to communicate better on what we really are, how we contribute to the prosperity that will be required to fight against global warming. I, I venture, I'll be controversial, I'll be provocative. It's, it, it's a battle you're losing at the moment in the public domain. I'm sorry, I mean, it's a, the, the, all the surveys show that travellers love to go on holiday and hate the fact that planes pollute. Obviously, we all hate the fact that uh, there is pollution. Uh, by the way, carbon is not pollution. Right? It's, uh, it's global warming, but the CO2 is not a polluter. OK, but that's not a minor uh, comment. So. But this being said, um, of, of course, and uh, as an individual as well, I really want to be able to 
uh, do what I do, and not only flying, all the human activities, uh, reducing the carbon footprint, so that, that's okay. But you're saying we are losing the battle. Well, there is more winds, obviously, there is more headwinds, and we need to do more. But I strongly believe aviation is part of the solution. It's part of the problem, but it's a bigger share of the solution uh, because we will need that prosperity to be able to do the, um, the energy transition. It's going to be very expensive, it's going to be long, and therefore we will need to be able to afford to do that. I've seen your plans for strange shaped aircraft with people sitting in the wing and I've seen your plans for hydrogen fuel and we're a long way off from the, I mean, from the fully electric powered aircraft. What's realistic in our lifetime, Guillaume? Uh, there are short term solutions, mid term solutions and more longer term ones. On the short term, uh, they are quick wins. Uh, air traffic management, and we just saw the announcement uh, in Europe today uh, of the, the commitment to simplify the sky and to be able to save uh, the uh, unnecessary uh, time um, in the air that uh, leads to delays, that leads to longer flights, to um, mm -hmm. non-economical flights, and also to unnecessary carbon emissions. Uh, on the short term as well, and that's probably the most important one and where we have the highest level of opportunity, it's on the SAFs, on the sustainable aviation fuels, because the planes we deliver are already capable of 50% of SAFs. And it's a bit like a, uh, a car that would be a plug-in hybrid, where you would never use the electricity in the battery, and you would always drive your car on kerosene. That's really a missed opportunity. So we really have an, an avenue here. We need to see this SAF industry growing, uh, so we could, on the short term, reduce the carbon emissions. And then there is more the long term and the mid term and long term with hydrogen and with e fuel synthetic fuels where there is huge potential to convert the aviation into carbon neutral and we are seriously working on this we have said at airbus that by 2035 we see the entry into service of the first hydrogen plane and for the moment we stick to that plan and there's a lot of work that is converging to make that possible 2035 all right, I will be, I'll be early 70s by then, but you say that you, you're, you know, we, we, we'll both be on a plane powered by hydrogen by 2035. Yeah. No deviation. You don't want to give yourself a qualification. You don't want to give yourself a get out of jail free card. Uh, there are challenges. Uh, there are challenges on the plane itself. We need to oh. work on technologies which are not very mature today. They are applied in other businesses, but they need to be matured for aviation. But it's really not unlikely that we will be ready for the technologies by 2025 and therefore be ready to launch a plane. There are other challenges, getting the certainty that there will be by 2035 enough fuels, decarbonized fuels to justify those investments on the plane. We need also alignment on the regulation, but honestly at the speed at which things are changing at the moment. I am more and more optimistic every day. Finally, you've got your 220, you've got your 320 family, you've got the 330 Neos, and you've got the 350. So you have a broad range now. You pretty much do it all. Where is your focus for future aircraft development? You're right in saying that uh, we have a very good portfolio of platforms. Uh, we believe the evolution uh, will be on those platforms, on systems, on connectivity, on energy, energy management, decarbonization of the planes. And we think those platforms have the potential to uh, embed uh, those changes on the different systems, uh, including the propulsion systems. So we are more looking on how we're going to evolve those platforms over time, like we do with the XLR, uh, like we could do for other of those uh, products with new variants um, and very much looking forward to introducing the decarbonization bricks at a later stage. One final scale that you need to do this is what? So there are multiple time scales here as I talked about. That is what we can do now and what we can do now is to accelerate SAF like Chris just said and invent all of these technologies that will also enable us in the future. And I think that let's not do the make the perfect the enemy of the possible. We just have to continuously improve until we get that 
level of zero emission and, and perfection uh, that you spoke about, Richard. And that's our, that's our noble cause that we all have to wake up every day uh, thinking about. And I think there's going to be a place in the future for SAF. I think there's going to be a place for hydrogen. And I think there's going to be a place for hybrid electric. And all of that is going to happen, and it's going to enable that sustainable future that we all are looking forward to. I was listening. I, I, I don't know if you heard me speak to uh, give me a, a, a Airbus, uh, and they're talking about twenty thirty five. I was working out how old I'll be um, by that by that age uh, or by that date to do that. What's the date on your calendar, uh, Chris? Would be. Let's, oh, sorry. Go ahead, okay. Well, no, 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 go no, you okay, Let me start. Let me start then. Please. We will be, we, we, we actually love what uh, Guillaume said and we'll be ready with the technology that will enable our customers and have our power, our trust under the wing. So you'll be ready by 2035 at least. All right, Chris, what will you be ready with? Uh, I think we are thinking it's closer to the middle of the century for things like that. With, and, and it's hard to predict a date until you really understand whether the technology can scale. Uh, but we've flown five different instances of hydrogen-powered airplanes, either fuel cells or, or liquid hydrogen with propulsion, uh, with combustion engines. So we've learned a lot about what that's going to take. We've been talking to people that are in the industrial use of hydrogen about what it takes to transport it and store it. And so we think it's closer to the middle of the century, and it'll probably enter the market in some of the lower uh, segments, uh, shorter haul segments, as electric will. And electric will... I think electric will come into the market sooner and initially be more of a change to road transport. And then it has the potential to scale if the battery technology can be resolved. And until then, I think the industry will continue to work on efficiency of engines and airframes and scale up sustainable aviation fuel. You see, that's fascinating, Chris, because that's, that's an extremely honest view, as indeed as Mohammed put it as well, on what is realistically possible. And the CEOs that I'll be talking to yet in a moment will wax lyrical about what they're doing and the incentives and things that they want. But the reality is what you've just said, isn't it, Chris? Well, I don't know if it's the reality. All we're saying is it's hard to predict those kind of things until you first get through the technology understanding and you know it can scale. And then I think we would all agree that's not the only thing you have to solve. You have to safely introduce these things into the airspace and to certify them and you have to make the changes to the infrastructure. We enjoy the societal benefits of a globally connected business and the infrastructure that has to change to be able to operate these new technologies globally is not trivial. Even once you've solved the technology issues associated with how you put it on a flying machine or make a fuel out of it. And Richard, this is really an important point. I think there's gonna be a place for SAF, there's gonna be a place for hydrogen, there's gonna be a place for hybrid electric. And it's upon us to enable SAF and accelerate it and invent these technologies, other technologies also for the future. And the public is expecting us to do that safely foremost. Do you and think affordably, affordably, and at the same time protect the future of our planet. And, I, and as an engineer, I'll tell you, I embrace that challenge. I, I, I studied and I worked hard to embrace that challenge. 